Amen, amen, amen. Why don't you go ahead and find your seat this evening? Are you guys ready to have a great time in church? I think the church should be the most fun, exciting place on planet Earth, and this is going to be an amazing night. Amen? amen. I got about half of you with me. I'm going to see if I can get the rest of you with me by the end of the service here. Hey, before we get going, uh, there is a very, very, very special group of people that we need to remember and honor this evening. This is Veterans Day weekend, and if you are a veteran, would you stand so we can honor you this evening? We got any veterans with us tonight? Let's honor our veter veterans. There we go. <clears throat> Appreciate so very much each and every single one of you. Well, again, tonight is going to be an amazing evening. I hope that you are ready to hear from God's Word. Are you ready to hear from God's Word tonight? Yes. Pastor Tim has been going through a series these past few weeks on, on wisdom, and, and he will be back with us next week, and I believe speaking on that topic. But this evening, uh, we want to take a look. I want to take a look at a topic that I'm pretty sure applies to just about everybody, maybe even everybody in this room, and that is the topic of anxiety. Anybody here ever been anxious before? Anybody here ever experienced some fear before, some worry before? I saw a lot of hands going up there, so Pastor Clark, I think I got... I think we got the right message for the right crowd tonight. And so, uh, again, we are, we are going to have a great night talking about the topic of anxiety. And I really do think that it's something that applies to just about every single person or every single person at some point in time or another. I mean, maybe you're here tonight and, and you got some good stuff going on in your, your life and you're pretty excited about what's coming up, but you're a little anxious. You don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Maybe you're here tonight and, and you're expecting your first child and, and you're excited about that, but you're also thinking about, man, that's, a, that's another mouth to feed and there's diapers and there's all this expense. I, I don't know how I'm going to handle the, the finances of this, but, but I'm excited or maybe you're here tonight and you're on the other side and, and life hasn't been going so good. Maybe you've got a, a parent that's getting up there at age and, and their health isn't doing so well and you're kind of, you know, you're worried about them, you're concerned about them, you're kind of anxious for them. Or maybe some of you are here this evening and, and uh, tomorrow's going to be a great day. You're starting a, a brand new job and you're excited about that, but you're also a little anxious, you're a little worried, you're a little concerned. You don't know exactly what it's going to be like. You'd, you're not sure if you got what it takes to, to, to do the job. You don't, you don't know what your boss is going to be like, whatever. And so you're excited about tomorrow, but you're also a little bit fearful for what it might hold. Or maybe this week, the opposite again, maybe this week, you were let go from your job, your, your company downsized or whatever, and, and, and you're thinking about, I don't even know how I'm going to pay my bills this week. I don't know how I'm going to pay my, my bills this month. And so you're, you're anxious, you're, you're worried, you're fearful. Maybe there's some here tonight, you're anxious, worried, fearful, because your, your health hasn't been going well, your physical health, or, or maybe it's your emotional health. You've just been wrestling with a lot of things in, in your mind, and, and you're just not really sure uh, what's going on. I mean, anybody here ever been anxious before? I mean, there's just so many things we could be anxious about. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a kid. You got a, a kid and you know they're going to school tomorrow and you know the friends that they've put around them and you know the influence those friends have in their life and, and you're worried, you're concerned, you're anxious about your kid. Or again, maybe you're going to work tomorrow and you just know that you're going to have to face that boss that you really don't want to have to face. Or, or maybe you're going to go to work tomorrow and you are the boss and, and you don't know how you're going to deal with that employee. Or maybe you're going to go and, and you don't know how you've been getting by on some pretty razor thin margins. You're not even sure how you're going to pay your employees this week. I mean, all of us from time to time, we experience these things in our lives that cause us to be anxious, that cause us to be fearful. But there's a verse in the Bible, it's found in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? That's a pretty tough assignment, isn't it? But the Bible says it, so I, I think that it's, it must be doable then. And so here's what I want to do tonight. I want to take a look at one passage of Scripture. And I want to unpack it. And I hope that all of us will leave here tonight 
with some tools in our belt that we can implement when we're facing those things that cause us to be anxious, when we are facing those things that cause us to be fearful or worried, we'll have some tools about that we can implement so that we can more fully live out this verse to be anxious for nothing. Sound like a plan? Got some of you with me? Maybe like a third of you, but it's enough. So I'm going to keep going on here. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. For the sake of time, we'll read four verses, verses 6 through 9. And here is what we read. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful for these moments that we have around your word here tonight. God, we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. Lord, that every single one of us would hear your voice and that every one of us would respond to your voice, God, how you would have us to respond. God, be with us here tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, today, what I want to do is I want to give you five things from 1 Peter chapter 5 that I believe we can use, five tools we can use when we're feeling anxious. And if you're taking notes, and if you missed an outline, just raise your hand, the ushers, uh, they'll get one to you right away. Just keep your hand up there. If you're taking notes tonight, the first blank is very simply this. In order to deal with our anxiety, the first thing we can do is get some perspective. Get some perspective. Read with me again verse 8 where it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be alert and of sober mind. Have any of you ever met somebody when something's going on in their life, the, again, the enemy's roaring, they're facing a difficulty, a challenge, something that's causing them to worry and concern? Have you ever met somebody who's going through something like that and the very last thing that they are is sober minded? You ever met somebody whenever they come up against something in life, the first thing they tend to do is kind of freak out? Anybody here yourself, you've ever freaked out before, you overreacted to something? I know a guy. Uh, a couple, whatever it was, a couple months ago, I guess now, uh, uh, he was, uh, like many of us, he was getting ready for bed, and so he set his alarm for the next day. Got out his iPhone, set his alarm for nice and early, 5 a.m., wanted to get a, a jump on the day, and set his alarm, and you know, plugged in his phone, set it right down on the nightstand. Got into bed, looking forward to waking up nice and early the next morning. He didn't really have a busy morning the next day, no early appointments. And, and to be quite honest, he has one of those jobs that's pretty flexible. Whether he showed up at six like he was hoping to or nine o'clock, the boss probably wouldn't even really know, much less care. But, but again, he wanted to get up nice and early. But he noticed when he woke up the next morning that it was just a little bit lighter than what it should have been at five o'clock in the morning. And so he kind of jumped up and reached over and grabbed his phone and, and tried to check the, the time to see what time it was, but, but his phone was dead because although he had plugged it in up here, it had come unplugged down by the plug. And he immediately started freaking out. I mean, he's freaking out, Pastor Clark. I mean, he's like, uh, you know, he's huffing and puffing. He's woke his wife up and he's, he's saying things like, stupid iPhone. Like, it's the phone's fault that it didn't get plugged in. And, and he's saying things like, I can't believe I messed this up. I'm so stupid as if really it was, you know, his stupidity that led to it, the cord coming undone. And even went as far as to say, this day is ruined. This day is ruined. Now, he woke up at 6.15. He had overslept 75 minutes. He had no early morning appointments. Boss wasn't going to notice if he came in a little bit late. Probably going to be up till 10 o'clock or whatever that night. So that four, 15 hours of the day left or whatever. But the day was already ruined. Anybody ever overreacted like that? Now, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, how can you really know that much detail about people's lives? Well, I won't, I won't tell you who that was. But there, there's a small chance it might have been me. But, uh, you know. <laughs> We all do it. We all freak out. We all overreact. And I think one of the first things we can do whenever we're starting to experience anxiety, the first, one of the first things we can do when we're starting to, to, to feel fear and overwhelmed is just take a step back and get some perspective. 
You know, I think of the story uh, in the Gospels. Jesus is with his disciples. They're hanging out. They're having a good day. And apparently it was a beautiful day out. And they decided, hey, let's go out on a boat. Let's go out onto the lake. And, and they went out on, the, out on the lake. And the day is just beautiful. Jesus lays down on the back of the boat. He's taking a nap, whatever. And disciples are doing whatever they're doing, fishing or rowing or sailing. I don't know what they were doing. They're just enjoying the nice, beautiful day out. And then out of the middle of nowhere... Out of the middle of nowhere, this huge storm comes, comes up. The, the wind starts whipping. That makes the waves start crashing over the boat. The, the rain is coming down. It's pounding down. And, and, and I mean, what, the disciples, they just start freaking out. I mean, they just start going frantic. And the and Bible even says that some of them says, the boat is going down. We're all going to die. And then somebody remembers, Jesus is on the boat with us. And so they go and they wake up Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He calms the storm. The rain stops. The wind stops. The waves stop. And everybody is safe. For some of you here today, the enemy has been roaring really loud. You've been facing some difficult times. You've been facing some difficult situations. And, and the anxiety has been building. The fear has been building in your life. You've been going through a storm like the disciples were going through a storm. And, and what you need to do is you need to take a step back, get some perspective, and remember that Jesus is on the boat with you. You don't have to go through whatever you're going through alone. So number one, I think the thing that we can do if we want to deal with our anxiety is just to take a step back and get some perspective. Number two. A second tool we can use if we're going to deal with anxiety and fear and worry and concern is we need to, number two, change the channel. Change the channel. Here's what I mean by that. Read with me again in verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Have you ever wondered why lions roar? I mean, have you really ever thought, but why do lions roar? Lions roar because they want to let other lions know that they are there. They want to try to intimidate other lions and, and make them feel like they are bigger than they are. They want to tell them that that's their area and scare them off. Basically, the reason that lions roar is because they're trying to get into the head of other lions. And I think that the reason that our enemy roars as loudly as he does sometimes Sometimes when we go through difficult things like we go through sometimes, sometimes when that enemy's roaring as loud as, as he is, it's because he's trying to get into our head. And how do we keep him out of our head? Well, verse 9 gives us the answer. It says, resist him standing firm in the faith. Resist him standing firm in the faith. That is, stop listening to the roar of the lion and start listening to the faith. Stop listening to the roar of the lion and start listening to the voice of God. The problem is, is that so many of us, we, we, all we do is listen to the lion. And what we actually really need to do for some of us to deal with our anxiety, what we actually need to do is we need to change the channel. We need to stop listening to the roar of the lion. We need to stop listening to our problems. We need to stop listening to our own voice. We need, and we need to start listening to the voice of God. Now, if you know anything about me, there's actually, like, there's, there's a few things, but there's three things in particular that I, I absolutely hate in this world. One, I hate stickers. I hate stickers. They get gunk on everything. They just mess everything up. I hate stickers. I hate traffic because traffic, well, it's traffic and I don't like it. But three, I hate commercials. I loathe commercials. And you know what I do? If a commercial comes on the radio, I just change the channel. Because I don't want to listen to it. If I'm watching TV and a commercial comes on, do you know what I do? I change the channel because I don't want to deal with it. In fact, that's not even true anymore. I've actually just bought my way out of commercials. I purchased Spotify so that I don't have to listen to the radio. Commercial-free uh, radio. I got Netflix so that I don't have to watch commercials. I just, I hate commercials. And if one comes on, that's exactly what I do. I change the channel. And for some of you, you've been listening to the roar of the enemy. You've been listening to your problems. You've been listening to all this. And what you need to do is you need to change the channel and start listening to the voice of God. 
The problem for some of us is that like, it's like we're just attracted to be over here. It's like this late night infomercial that we just can't get away. We know we should change the channel. We know we don't need whatever they're selling. But for some reason, we just keep watching it. It's just mesmerizing watching this, this info. And somehow or another, we even end up buying whatever they're selling, even though we definitely don't know we don't need what they're selling. But, that, but that's what we do. We just kind of get like glued in over here. So much so that all we hear is the roar of the enemy. All we hear is our, our problem. All we think about is the difficulty that we're going through. And, and we pay so much attention to this that it literally drowns out the voice of God. We pay so much attention listening to the roar of the enemy that we, we don't even have room for God's voice in our own life. I got two sons, Jack and Lucas. And uh, this past week, my wife is away. She went to uh, the wedding of one of her cousins, so I was doing dad duty. And, and it happened to follow, uh, fall over Halloween. And uh, <clears throat> my kids, like many kids, you know, Halloween, I mean, between all the school parties and everything else, I mean, they amassed what can only be described as a giant stockpile of candy. I mean, tens upon tens of pounds of just candy. And I can remember my wife was away, and so I picked up the kids at school, and we went home one evening. And uh, I still had a little bit of work to do, and so I was like, hey, boys, I'm going to finish this work up, and then I will make you dinner. And uh, I went down and I, you know, I'm doing my work and I realized that more time had gone by than what I had thought was going to happen. And, and it was about eight o'clock at night or so. And I was like, man, I got to get my kids dinner. And so I came upstairs and I bumped into my, uh, my eight-year-old Lucas and I said, hey, Lucas, are you hungry? And he goes, no, nah, I'm good. I'm like, what? And he's usually got a pretty good appetite, you know. So for him to say he's not hungry, number one, but especially this time of night, I was like, but all right, whatever. And so I just made myself a sandwich and then I went to throw something away in the garbage can. And I noticed that on the top of the garbage can, there were some candy wrappers. But not just like a few candy wrappers. The entire top of the garbage can was covered in candy wrappers. So I got curious. How deep does this go? It was several inches of candy wrappers. Do you want to know why my son Lucas was so full that he couldn't eat what would have probably only been a semi-nutritious meal that I would have made for him? You know why he couldn't eat? Because he had filled his life with junk. And that's like some of us. We spend so much time listening to the enemy. We spend so much time listening to the roar of the enemy. We spend so much time thinking about and, and, and listening to our problems that, that, that there's literally no room left for God to speak into our lives. And so for what some of us need to do here this evening is we literally need to turn this off. we got to turn the channel and stop listening to the voice of the enemy and start listening to the voice of God. We need to stop listening to our problems and start listening to what God is saying to us. Number three, a third tool that we can use if we want to do it, deal with our anxiety. Number three, we need to do it God's way. We need to do it God's way. Read with me again verses six and seven. It says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. When most people read this passage, you know what they do? They actually skip right over verse 6 and go right to verse 7. We love verse 7, don't we? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I mean, we underline that verse. We highlight that verse. We memorize that verse. It's a great verse. The problem is, is that right before verse 7 is verse 6. The two actually go together. They're really one thought. If you were reading this, it should say, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And if you humble yourself, then you can cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The challenge is, is that many of us, we miss that humbling part. And that humbling part, what is that? That humbling part is us saying, you know what? I don't have the answers, but God does. Uh, the humbling part is, I don't know the best way to handle this problem. I don't know the best way to handle this difficulty, but, but God does. See, what most of us do is we skip right over verse 6 and go to verse 7. We skip right over verse 6 and we, and we try to handle our problems in our own strength and in our own ability and in our own wisdom and power. We do this in a lot of different areas in our lives. And what happens is, is when we try to handle things on our own, we kind of back ourselves into a corner. And it's when we get ourselves backed into the corner and we don't know what to do. That's when we quote verse 7, God, I cast all my anxiety on you because you care for me. I mean, some people, they do this with their finances. 
You know, rather than, uh, you know, handling their finances in a godly way, they do it however they want. And maybe they buy some stuff that they, they shouldn't have bought and they get themselves in a little bit of, uh, of debt. And then uh, rather than following biblical principles and saving for in emergencies, they, they don't have a rainy day fund. And then the bad times come and they don't have any money. And, and then maybe rather than practicing biblical stewardship and tithing, they handle their finances their way. And so God can't bless them like he wants. And, and so what they do with every decision, trying to handle things their way, they just kind of back themselves further and further into a corner. And then when their finances are a mess, when they're drowning in debt, when they don't know which way to turn, then they quote verse seven saying, God, I cast all my anxiety on you because you care for me. Some people, they do it with their marriage. Rather than having a biblically centered marriage, rather than having Christ at the center of their life, they try to just do things their way. Rather than exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in their, in their marriage, they, you know, they, 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 they do it their way. And rather than putting their spouse before themselves and the needs of their spouse before themselves like God would have them to, they do it their way. And, and they back themselves in their marriage further and further and further into a corner. Until they, their marriage is a mess, their spouse is talking about divorce, they don't know what to do, they don't know what way to turn. And then when their back is against the wall, then they cry out to God, God, they quote verse six or verse seven saying, God, I cast all my anxiety on you because you care for me. Some people, they do it with maybe habits. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's drugs, whatever, you know, and, and rather than, than, than trusting God to help them and rather than getting godly accountability and, and rather than getting, you know, getting involved in the programs of the church, celebrate recovery or whatever it is, they, they make decision after decision of their own and they back themselves further and further in cor- into a corner until their life is a mess. And then when their life is a mess and they don't know what way to turn, then they quote verse seven, God, I cast all my anxiety on you because you care for me. And I don't know what God thinks, but I have to think that God, you know, he said, you know, he's thinking something like, I'm glad you're casting all your anxiety on me, but you missed a step. Verse six comes before verse seven. You would be so much better off if you would just do things my way. And I think that there's a lot of us here this evening, maybe we're experiencing some anxiety and some fear because we've just backed ourselves into a corner. And the one thing that we could do is just say, God, I just humble ourselves and say, God, I know I don't have the answers. I've made a mess out of my life. God, I know I don't, have, I don't know the best way to do this, but you do. And so I want to humble myself and I just want to trust you. Some of us have a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of worry because we've just been trying to do it in our own strength and wisdom. And that's not the way to do it. Number four. Number four, we have to remember that God is close. We have to remember that God is close. Read with me again, verse seven, it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him. You know what that verse says to me? It says that God is within casting distance. It says that God is within throwing distance. It means when we cast all our anxieties on him, that he's close enough to catch them. And he's not going to drop them. The psalmist says that when we cry out, when we call out, when we pray, that God hears our voice. That God hears our prayers. God is within speaking distance. Jesus himself said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. It means that God is within walking distance. You know, sometimes I think we have a lot of fear and worry and anxiety because we just feel like we're all alone. And there's nobody who's walking with us through whatever it is we're walking through. But the reality is, is for those who are here tonight who have a relationship with God, who have a relationship with Jesus, that we are never alone. That God is close. I told this story a while back, I went back and looked. It's actually been about seven years, so most of you haven't heard it. And, and for those of you who have, half of you probably forgot it. And for the other half, it's a great story, so enjoy it a second time. But about, uh, about 10 years ago, my wife and I, we bought our first home. And uh, like some many first-time home buyers, you know, we were really trying to get that, that down, uh, down payment all together. And, and I'll admit, it, you know, we were 
I mean, we were looking everywhere. I mean, it was all but like going through the couch cushions, looking for quarters and nickels and dimes to try to come up with the, with the down payment to buy this home. And, and probably our, our biblical financial team would not uh, be super happy with, with the way we handled things. But again, we were, just try, we were trying to get the down a good deal. We didn't want to miss it. And so we were trying to get the down payment together. And, and, and my wife, we probably left ourselves with too small of a cushion. We put too much into the, the down payment and left ourselves with too small of a cushion. In fact, I can even remember when we bought the home that I, I said, you know, I remember praying, God, it would be really awesome if there would be no major problems for a little while. <laughs> Small problem can have no major problems, God. That would be, that'd be really awesome. And uh, I can remember uh, we bought the home in like January and uh, that particular spring, it was a pretty rainy spring. And we had noticed like, you know, like quite a few people, there's a little bit of water in the basement, whatever, but we were also starting to have some issues with this pipe that was backing up. And again, probably not great godly uh, wisdom, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of ignored it for, for a little while and then it kind of did it again. And, and so finally I, I said, you know, well, I'll get this looked at. And so I had a guy who came out and, and looked at the pipe. And he came out, he poked around, he did his thing. He said, yep, be glad to help you out. No problem at all. We'll be $8,500 to fix the pipe. I'm like, well, I ain't got $8,500, Pastor Clark, to fix this pipe. And so I said, it was nice talking to you. I'll see you maybe well into the future when I've saved up some money for this. And again, probably not great godly wisdom, but my grand strategy for dealing with this problem at that time was just, I'm just going to ignore it and see if it goes away. How many people know that doesn't usually work? It didn't work in this case either. A few months go by and the problem actually gets worse. We're noticing like when we're doing laundry, it's starting to back up. And even got to the point sometimes we were flushing our toilets. It was this pipe that was the, the big pipe that goes out to the street and everything. It was actually starting to back up. And my wife was a saint throughout this entire, pro I mean, she never complained at all. But I could tell we had a young, Jack would have been like one or two at the time. And, and uh, you know, so we got a toddler and we're having issues with laundry and he flushing the toilet. It was just... I could just tell that I needed to get this fixed. And I wanted to get this fixed. I mean, I'm the man of the house. I, mean, I felt like I, I, this is partially my responsibility. But again, I had no money for it. I'm like, God, I got a small part of this. I, and I just remember being incredibly frustrated, incredibly flustered, incredibly worried, concerned. In fact, it was so much that I, I remember one day I actually came in to the house and, and uh, the, the stairs went down into the basement where this pipe was at. And I remember I, I came in and, and I just kind of sat down on the stairs. And I just looked at that pipe. I mean, actually, I just glared at that pipe. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I, I'm not a super emotional person. I don't, but, but in that moment, I, I just remember just being overwhelmed. Anxiety, worry, concern. Again, want to provide for my family, but, but don't have the means to get this problem fixed. And I remember just saying, God, I, I don't know what to do. I need help. My wife came home that night. And we talked about it, prayed about it, and she said, you know, let's just, let's just get another, uh, another opinion on, on this. And so we talked a little bit more, and she, at the time I was the children's pastor here at the church, and she said, isn't so-and-so's dad a plumber? And so I called him up, and he said, yeah, I'm a plumber. That's not really the plumbing that I help with, or I know much about that. Again, that's the big pipe going out to the street. I do more in, indoor plumbing. And he said, but he goes, I know a guy. Now, how many people love it when somebody knows a guy? He's like, I know a guy. And he's like, let me, let me give you a call back in just a bit. And so he called this guy, called me back. He said, he can come by tomorrow. Can you be there? I said, sure, I'll, I'll be there. Absolutely, man, I want to get this done. I will be there, whatever time it was, sometime in the afternoon. And I remember the guy came over, and we started talking a little bit, you know, small talk. You know, he's working in the basement or whatever. And, and, uh, and, you know, he asked me what I did for a living. I said, well, I'm a pastor at a church. Oh, what church do you go to? I go to Calvary Christian Church. And, and uh, he goes, well, I know Calvary. My dad used to go there. He told me who his dad was. I'm like, oh, I remember your dad. And again, we're just making small talk. And, and somewhere in the, in the process, you know, he said, well, I got bad news and good news. I said, well, let's just start with it, man. What's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is that the guy who was here before me really didn't do a very good job. He didn't treat you well. In fact, I didn't want to say anything when I came in because I don't like to talk bad about another company. But quite honestly, it's just not a good company. I said, well, what's the good news? He goes, the good news is I can fix it for a few hundred bucks. Now, hold on, the story gets a lot better. Okay, don't get ahead. <clears throat> I'm like, well, that's awesome. A few hundred bucks, I can deal with. You know, 8,000 can't, but a few hundred, great. So he starts working. I remember I went over to the cabinet. I grabbed a, a can of Diet Wild Cherry Pepsi. 
Went down, sat on the step. I'm like, I'm just going to watch this guy work. Maybe I'll learn something. I don't know. And, you know, we're, we're talking, whatever. So he finishes up, and he starts packing up all his tools and going outside. And I'm like, hey, man, uh, should I write you a check? You know, he goes, you know what? Don't worry about it at all. He goes, you know, every day. I remember saying this. Every day I pray for God to give me someone to bless, and I feel like I'm just supposed to bless you today. Hold on. The story gets better. The story gets better. We hadn't told a ton of people about what was what was going on, but we had, we had told a few. And uh, I can remember it was shortly thereafter, I got a call from someone and they said, you know, hey, Pastor Jamie, uh, we kind of know what's going on and it's not going to cover the whole amount, but, but, but uh, we and, and some other people, we've gotten some money together that we want to give you to kind of help with this, this pipe, this problem you have. And, and I got to tell the story just like I just, you know, a little bit about what was, had just happened and how God had just miraculously pr- provided. And, and I remember that after that, I, I came and, and I, uh, back into my house and I, and I went down to those steps and I looked at those, I sat down those steps and I looked at that pipe again and, and there's only really been probably two times in my entire life. I've never actually heard an audible voice from God, never. But there's been two times in my life where I, I would just say that I've just felt God's presence in a tangible way and, and in that moment I felt God say to me, Jamie, what on earth were you worried about? What on earth were you worried about? In this case, I chose to provide through a plumber who you've never even, you'd never even met before. And had I chose not to do that, then I would have provided, uh, I've made you a part of a church family that would have taken care of you and, and we would have gotten through it. But even if I hadn't done it that way, there's a million other ways that I could have handled this. Jamie, what on earth were you worried about? You know, I tell that story today not to make the point that God's gonna take care of your problems with a can of Diet Wild Cherry Pepsi, uh, But I tell that story today to show that God is close, that God is with us, that God is there for us, no matter what we go through. I remember just feeling so overwhelmed, feeling so overwhelmed, but remembering that God was there for me in that moment. And maybe there's some of you who are here and you're just, man, you're going through it and you feel all alone. You feel so alone. You're not. God is nearby. God cares for us. Number five is the musicians make their way up here. the fifth tool that we can implement, the fifth tool we can use if God is going to be with us, if God's going to help us with our anxiety, the fifth tool we can use is we need to move from I to us. From I to us. Read with me again verse 9. Verse 9 says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Now, there's a lot that we could take from this verse, but allow me just to make one simple point. You are not supposed to go through this alone. God has made us a a part of a, a, a family of believers so that when we face things, we do not have to face it alone. I think a lot of the times the reason that we face so, many, so much anxiety, a lot of times that we face so many problems, the, uh, the, the reason that we, we have so much fear in our life is that we try to face it by ourselves. And we say things like, I'm going to handle this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix this problem. And I think a lot of times we have fear and anxiety because we're trying to handle it all on our own. Have you ever actually looked at the word anxious before? I mean, have you ever looked at the actual word anxious? What is right at the middle of the word anxious? It's I. I is right at the middle of the word, of the actual word anxious. And I believe that I is at the middle of all of our anxiety. Again, when we make it all about ourselves, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to deal with this problem. When we take all of the weight 
of whatever that we're facing, when we take all the weight of whatever we're going through and we, and we say that I'm going to be the one to carry this burden all by myself, that's why we experience anxiety because I is right at the middle of the word anxious and I believe that I is right at the, at the middle of our anxiety as well. You ever notice how the word anxious ends though? It ends with the letters U-S, us. The literal word anxious ends by going from I to us. And the fifth point here is that I believe our anxiety ends when we move from I to us. When we, just, when we go from saying, you know what, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to deal with this problem. I'm going to take care of this myself to realizing that God has made us part of a large church family, of a church family that can be there for one another that we don't have to go through things alone, that we don't have to carry this burden by ourselves. I believe that we can get rid of a lot of our anxiety when we move from I to us. That's what this verse is saying. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers, we are a part of a, a family of believers that's going undergoing the same kind of sufferings and we're supposed to be there for them when they're going through difficult times and they're supposed to be there for us when we're going through difficult times. And there's a lot of people here tonight, you, I mean, the, you're carrying around this burden all about yourself. You're trying by yourself. You're trying to handle this problem all by yourself. It's, you know, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna take care of this. I'm gonna do this. And this burden that you're carrying is getting really, really heavy. And to be honest, you're probably about to drop it because you're trying to do it all alone, but you were never meant to do it all alone. You were meant to share that burden with your family, with the family of believers. And for some of you here tonight, the thing that you could do that would help you deal with your anxiety more than anything else, the fear that you're experiencing here today, or, or the, the thing that you could do the most would be to come. Maybe in just a few moments, we're gonna have some altar workers here at the altar. And maybe tonight, some of you literally just need to come and say, you know what, I've been carrying this burden all by myself for so long. And I just need somebody to pray for me. I just need to tell somebody what's going on in my life. I just need to tell somebody what I'm going through. And the moment that you just come forward and have somebody pray for you, and the moment that you just tell them what you're going through, you're gonna immediately just feel this, the, the anxiety just kind of fade away. Because for the very first time, you're, you're going to share that burden with someone else. You see, so many of us were carrying around this awful weight all by ourselves, and we were never meant to carry that weight all by ourselves. We were meant to share it with one another. It was never supposed to be, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to figure this out. We were supposed to do it together, us together. Tonight, there are many of you Maybe you got anxiety and fear and worry and concern. I believe that when we look here at 1 Peter, there are some tools here that we can use so that we don't ever have to deal with fear and anxiety and concern again. Maybe there's some here tonight, you, the thing you need to do is just take a step back and get some perspective and realize, you know what, maybe it's not as bad as, as I thought it was going to be or, or whatever. Or, or, but even if it is, the, 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 you know what, the God's with me on the boat. Maybe some of you are here tonight and, and the thing that you need to do is you just need to change the channel. Man, you've been listening to the enemy. You've been listening to that voice for so long that it's literally drowned it out, the, the message of God. And you just need to change the channel and stop listening to the enemy and you need to start listening to God. And maybe there's some of you here tonight. You've been trying to deal with whatever you've been dealing with all by yourself. You've been trying to do it your way. You've been trying to, you know, figure it out. You're, and all you've done is backed yourself in a corner. And what you need to do today is you just simply need to say, you know what? I'm going to stop doing it my way. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to do it God's way. And when I do it God's way, I know I can cast all my concerns on him. I can cast all my anxiety on him. Maybe there's some. Man, you just feel like you've been going through it all alone. And you're worried. You're concerned. You just remember that God is close. But I imagine that there's quite a few of us here tonight. We've been trying to carry the burdens that we have in our lives all by ourselves. And for you, what you need to do is you just need to find someone. Have them pray for you. Tell them what's going on in life. And I think that if we do these things, that all of us, if we do these things, that all of us can see the anxiety in our life go away. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful 
for these moments around your word. God, I pray for each and every single one of us here tonight. Lord, we all face problems. We all face difficulties. We all face challenges. Lord, we all face these things in our lives that cause us to have concerns. And Lord, I pray for every single person here. Lord, that when we have these things going on in our lives, Lord, that we would take the message from here tonight. And Lord, that we would that we would apply it to our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed, here's where I want to end here tonight. First, I want to end here tonight by asking if there's anybody here, and if you were honest, you've just been experiencing so much anxiety and worry and concern and fear because you really have been trying to do this alone. You've been trying to carry the burden of whatever you've got going on in life all by yourself. And and if you're honest, you don't even have a relationship with God. You don't have a relationship with Christ. And so you truly have been trying to do this on your own. But tonight is the night you want to get your life right with God. You want to begin a relationship with Jesus so that you don't have to do this alone anymore. That you can have a Lord and a Savior who will be there with you, that will be close by. And so first here tonight, if you're here this evening and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, if you want to begin a relationship with God, I would love the opportunity to pray with you. And I'd just love to know who I'm praying for tonight. So if you're here tonight and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, you want to begin a relationship with God, would you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you this evening? So your hand, buddy. Anybody else? Tonight's the night you want to get your life right with God. Would you just raise your hand so I can I see your hand, buddy? Anybody else? Is there anyone else here this evening? Did I see your hand, ma'am? Anybody else here tonight? Tonight's the night you want to get your life, God. You want to, we're right with God. You want to begin a relationship with Christ so that you don't have to do this alone anymore. Anybody else? Three have raised their hand. Father, for each and every single one that raised their hand this evening, God, I pray that you would speak continue to speak to their hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that the decision that they've made here this evening, God, you solidify that in their heart. And God, from this moment forward, they would know that they are not walking alone, but God, that you are by their side. God, may you lead them, may you guide them, may you direct their lives. God, may you be the center, may you be their Lord and Savior. God, we pray. Secondly, maybe you're here this evening. If you were honest, You've been pretty anxious. You've had a lot of worry, fear, concern. In just a moment, we're gonna, the worship team's gonna lead us in another song. We're gonna open up these altars. And I'd invite you to come and to pray. Maybe you wanna find somebody to pray with here. But I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed, if if you're here tonight and, and you just say, Pastor, I'd love for you to pray for, I mean, I've just been going through it. I've just been worried. I've just been concerned. My life has just been riddled with anxiety, and I would just love for you to pray for me this evening. I'd love to pray for you if you just raise your hand. Is there anybody here? You've just, man, you've just been going through it. Lord, for each and every one here this evening, God, who's just been, just life has just been coming up again, again against them, and Lord, they've just been experiencing fear and anxiety. Lord, I pray that tonight, that your word, that the message from your word would just soak into their hearts and in their lives, God. And that they would leave here, uh, Lord, with just the confidence, God, that again, you are with them. They have a church family that's with them, that they're not alone. And God, no matter what it is that they're going through, though, that they can make it through because again, you are with them. I ask that everybody stand again. The worship team, they're gonna lead us in another song here. As they do. If you want to come and pray, these altars are open. Again, there's altar workers here. They'd love to pray with you. If you are one of those who raised your hand and said that you would like to begin a relationship with God, I would invite you as people are, are making their way forward, you come forward as well. Find one of these altar workers. They'd love to pray with you. they got a gift they'd like to give you. But let's take just a few moments or around the, the altar tonight and, and let's just uh, spend some time seeking God. When you feel that God has released you, you are free to go.